Hello, everyone. Good morning. Whoa, this is a deep seat. It's a very soft cushion. My name is Alex Wagner, and I am a senior editor at The Atlantic. Welcome to the sixth annual Texas oh, Tribune up. Festival, and welcome to our fantastic August panel, where we will explore the, the central question of American politics today, can the center hold? This panel is supported by the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And now I'd like to introduce you to the fantastic woman and men <laughs> sitting to my right. Former Congressman, actually let me go in order. Former Congressman Tom Davis of Virginia was elected to the House in 1994 and served seven consecutive terms. During his tenure, he was also chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee. He is co-author of The Partisan Divide, Congress in Crisis. Um, Former Governor Ed Rendell served as Pennsylvania's governor from 2003 to 2011 and as mayor of Philadelphia from 1992 to 2000 and continues to be, I think, the best argument for the Keystone State. Um, former Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison of Texas served from 1993 to 2013. She was previously the Texas State Treasurer and a member of the Texas House. And immediately to my right, former Governor Bill Richardson and Ambassador Bill Richardson <laughs> served as New Mexico's governor from 2003 to 2011. He also served as a U.S. Congressman, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and Secretary of Energy under President Clinton. He happens to be wearing the best tie on stage today, I think. <laughs> uh, we will have a 15 to 20 minute period of Q&A at the end of this, but for the moment, let's get to it. And if you want to hashtag it, it is hashtag TTF. Other than that, please silence your phones. Um, so my friends on stage, uh, it's, been a, it's been a tumultuous year in American politics, and I'd like to ask the Democrats and Republicans on stage, let's start with the Republicans, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but what does 2016 tell moderate establishment Republicans, in your opinion? Okay, Bailey, why don't we start with you? Well, I think 2016 shows the either end of the spectrum, whether it's the far left or the far right, uh, the disgruntlement uh, that they have. And we're seeing it play out in the primaries, uh, both primaries. Uh, I think center has become a dirty word. Mm. Uh, people want somebody who is philosophically on their radar. And they're mad, they're upset, they're um, taking it out in the electoral system. And so center, to me, means that after the elections, you work with whoever is elected from a state or by our country, and you do the most that you can within your uh, priorities, but you don't expect everyone to agree with you on every subject. There is no purity when we have 50 states that have very different needs and very different constituencies. So um, what does the center hold for this election? Not much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Congressman Davis, when you look at this landscape, I mean, what should moderate Republicans think at this point? Well, they don't think much. I mean, there's not a, a lot of room for them right now. But you have to understand this, that the issues, globalization, uh, trade, uh, wealth disparity, in other countries it's playing out with third and fourth parties. We're doing all this within a two-party system. And instead of the parties centering themselves, that too, they've moved out left and right to accommodate it. And the other problem is with the single-party districts now, for most members, the, the only race that counts is the primary. And primary turnouts are very low, and you basically, you, you get the, the more, um, uh, I would say, energized elements left and right that show up. We used to say liberals and conservatives have passion, moderates have lives. So th they've been absent in the primaries, <laughs> which are basically where most of these elections are decided. Uh, and until you change that, I, I'm afraid we're going to continue to see this. Uh, Governor Rendell, I'd ask you a version of the same question. If you are a moderate Democrat that remembers Clintonian third-way centrism, what does 2016 tell you? Well, first of all, I'm not sure, sure that there isn't a place for people who are in the center. And I take uh, Senator Hutchinson's definition, I think, is right on. If you look at three primaries that I think were very instructive, Paul Ryan's, uh, John McCain's, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, they were all challenged from 
the, the, the far right or the f far left. And they all won by surprisingly large margins. A lot of money went into the campaign against Paul Ryan and he got almost 85% of the vote. John McCain clobbered his rival and everyone thought that would be close. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, notwithstanding all the trouble she was in, beat back a, a challenger who was funded fairly significantly by people in the Sanders wing of the party. So I'm not sure that it's been as bad a year for the establishment or center people. I think the presidential election, first of all, tell me where Donald Trump is. Is he far right? <laughs> is he moderate? Is he liberal? Uh, someone said we have two liberal Democrats from New York running for president. Right. Well, and I suspect they're probably right. I, I, let's talk a little bit about Hillary Clinton in specific, because the governor raises what's happening uh, in congressional elections. But Hillary Clinton has moved much further to the left than, for example, her president ever, her president, her husband, and the other former president, uh, President Clinton was. So, you know, what does that tell you about the state of democratic politics right now? <clears throat> well, I just want to say I'm very pleased to be here at the university. I have my papers at the Briscoe Center, and I'm not dead yet. So, that, <laughs> but my answer Congratulations is, on that. That I'm not dead or... Yeah, oh, okay. both. <laughs> both. One, one being more urgent than the other. You know, I, I, I think I agree with what Governor Rendell says, but I think there has been a transformation, a shift in the Democratic Party. When I was you know, in the Clinton administration, the Clinton years in the House, welfare reform, mm -hmm. free trade, balanced budget, uh, gro economic growth was a big, big issue. Um, I think Bernie Sanders, and I think to his credit, has talked about issues that fuel the reform movement that exists in the American people, the frustration, at least on the Democratic side. So that has moved the party to the left. I, I think there's no question about it, even though Ed's right. You know, there, every race uh, has its own distinct color. And, and you know, you, when you're a member of Congress, you're, you're entrenched. It's, it's tough to lose. You know, what I hope happens is that there be a rise of the Tom Davises and Kay Bailey Hutchinsons, the moderate Republicans, uh, after this election so that we can get something done. So this dysfunctional Congress doesn't continue. And I think the only way that'll happen uh, is with moderate Republicans. Uh, you know, I, I, I saw Tom Davis was a real, you know, operator in a positive way when we were in the House, but there's nobody there anymore that, that does what he used to do. So that's my hope that the message, obviously I want Secretary Clinton to win, but I, I want to see a vibrant, moderate Republican Party because if you look at the great legislation in this uh, that we've had, the Lyndon Johnson stuff, civil rights, uh, highway system, uh, environmental legislation, it was all done on a bipartisan yeah. basis. Energy, you, you can't do that anymore. It, uh, Congressman Davis, you, you, you brought up um, con congressional districts and primary. I, I'd like everybody to weigh in on this. And it's sort of a multiple choice question. If, what do you think is the greatest threat to sort of centrism and the centrist voter? Is it sort of electoral manipulation in the form of gerrymandering and um, money and its influence in the political process? Is it the great sort, the moving of Americans separating themselves to sort of ruralists and urbanists? Or is it technology and media bifurcation where people can sort of listen in their own echo chamber to folks who are like-minded and agree with them? Which of those has been the most threatening to the Well, center? I think they all play a role. It's, it, you put them together, it's, it's combustible. Because the money's moved away from the political parties out to, for basically the wings, although your more centrist elements are starting to get organized and starting their own super PACs now that, that are coming in for more centered uh, candidates. Uh, the districts, it's not just the sorting, it's the gerrymandering and, of course, the Voting Rights Act. I mean, the Deep South, all you have are black Democrats and white Republicans and no need to talk to the other side because they play no role. But I think this is the big culprit. Mm. How people receive their news, uh, what they tune into, what they want to hear, and the crap to content ratio coming over uh, the th this media <laughs> is exceptionally high. And people believe this stuff. And you go out and talk to them and everybody's got their own set of facts right now. 
So I think we have not learned to cope with that. I think that's, that plays a huge factor uh, in these races. I'd also just add one other thing. Uh, Ed, it's true that this year uh, moderates won some of the high-profile races, but what members do is they, uh, they move themselves right and left to protect themselves. So you beat one Eric Canner, it sends a, you know, a, a chill through the ranks. Now this year, for the first time, they beat one of the Freedom Caucus members, Holzkamp in Kansas, and maybe that sends a chill the other way. There's starting to be uh, some folks coming back saying this stuff is getting out of hand. So I think there's some hope. Let's, let, let, just to go back to that multiple choice question for a minute, uh, Senator Hutchison, when you think about the sort of biggest threat to the center, it, do you, would you agree with Congressman Davis that it's, it's about information and news and people sort of picking what they want and listening to like-minded folks, or do you think that it's something else? I agree with the things that you brought up. I agree with the Congressman. Uh, I would add one more thing. And I, th I do think gerrymander districts, so that primaries are all that matter, have made a big leap toward people on the uh, ends of the spectrum um, getting a leg up in a primary. I would say look at the states that have open primaries, mm -hmm. where you can go in, Louisiana, our neighbor, uh, you can go in and you can vote for a Republican for governor and a Democrat for lieutenant governor and a Republican for attorney general and a Democrat for state treasurer uh, based on what, who you think is the right person. If we open our primaries to letting people pick and choose, then the top two mm -hmm. will rise to a runoff unless someone gets 50% outright. And it could be two Republicans, it could be two Democrats or one of each, which is the norm. So I think doing two things, uh, better districting to encompass um, interest groups that are more similar in need, mm -hmm. like uh, a city like Austin, I think has at least maybe four congressmen, if not five, because you do the pie-shaped thing. And uh, so it's people, it's not all people who have the kind of interest of the city of Austin that are able to rise up. Governor Richardson, Ambassador Richardson, so many titles. Secretary Richardson, <laughs> where can I stop? Um, How about your highness? No, <laughs> just... <laughs> we'll work on that. Um, what about, I mean, so let's talk about gerrymandering and redistricting because it's been going on, it's been practiced since time immemorial. The, the 2010 redistricting largely at the hands of uh, conservative legislatures has been, I think, the most virulent in a lot of ways. Um, and, and I'm not sure it served the Republican Party in Congress all that well. Do you think there will be, in, in time for the 2020 census, do you think there will be a moment when Democrats and Republicans alike say, this is crazy and we need to, we need to, take, we need to make this a nonpartisan process? I'm not sure. You know, the, the biggest problem, and your question, the threat to the center, is the first one is gerrymandering. It is redistricting. And it's very simple. Members that are elected, Congress, state legislature, they don't want to give up their seats. They don't want to give yeah. up power. So you could have a district that all of a sudden becomes very Hispanic. And the incumbent is going to do everything he or she can to stay in power. And so you're fighting against an incumbency that is entrenched. Uh, hopefully something will change. Another threat to the center, I believe, is, is cable TV. Uh, to be successful in politics, to raise money, to, to gather your supporters, you gotta be either on the far right or the far left. The center, there, there is very little room. I mean, you can see with the rise of uh, conservative networks, and you can see it in certain social media sites. Mm -hmm. You can see it uh, across the board in uh, fundraising, super PACs. I think super PACs are, are the worst thing that's ever happened. And I believe that the fundraising, the number one, and I think the senator made some very good reform arguments, is, is find ways, you know, public financing, I think that's the best solution, but I don't see it happening. Um, some way to curb the influence of, of PACs and, and special interest money, although, you know, all of us, you know, we take it because it's part of the system. Right. Um, so, I, I, I'm, I'm, and I think the center is where potential agreements on 
on jobs, on infrastructure. And Ed, Ed Rendell is a leader in this country of, you know, promoting uh, jobs through infrastructure. Um, national security, national security bipartisanship should continue, should, should come back again. It's, it's gone in foreign policy, totally. Only, I believe, if a viable center in both sides emerges and gets stronger. Governor Rendell, let's talk about Pennsylvania. You know it well. Um, it's a swing state. What does the centrist voter even look like in this, in this year? Well, it's interesting. When you're talking about mayors and governors, they run in general elections where, of course, the entire electorate votes. So you get more centrist governors and more centrist mayors on both sides, Republican and Democrat. For example, on TPP, mm -hmm. 44 sitting mayors, Democratic mayors, wrote to Congress urging them to approve TPP because mayors have seen the benefits to their cities. 14 former Democratic governors, myself included, wrote to Congress to support TPP because in my eight years as governor, we invested a lot of money in getting our smaller and mid-sized manufacturing companies that never did export before to start exporting. We tripled the amount of exports that came out of Pennsylvania, creating a ton of good manufacturing jobs. So, but we run in the entire electorate, so we have to appeal. The most interesting election that makes the point that Senator Hutchinson made was when Senator Cochran, the Republican from uh, Mississippi, was running in an uh, uh, open primary. And it was a runoff. And he was running against a Tea Party candidate who was far to the right. Cochran won with the help of African-American Democrats. Yeah. African-American Democrats. So the senator's right. It even redistricting, when there's citizen initiatives, ballot questions, citizens are taking back the redistricting process. But not all states have ballot initiatives. So the key is an open primary, either what the senator described, which is a jungle primary, meaning no, no party affiliations. You can have a party affiliation, but the top two appear in the general election. And for example, in California, the top two Senate candidates are both Democrats. Or an open primary, which just says anyone can go in and vote in either primary they want. That's really the answer because it brings the center in and the candidates have to appeal to the, the centrist voters. If you look at trade, if you poll trade, trade is not overwhelmingly disapproved by the American people. There are a ton of Americans who believe trade is a good idea, obviously trade with the right conditions and limitations, and they would be heard from in a open primary. The jungle primary. Right. I just like saying jungle primary. Yeah. <laughs> um, Conjures up great images. Right. <laughs> Darwin, electoral Darwinism. Um, uh, Congressman Davis, the center is where things get done in Congress, right? right? So I, I ask you to sort of extrapolate from a scenario in which Hillary Clinton is president, but the Republicans keep the Senate. What do you think, if anything, the American public can expect from Congress, from the center, by way of legislation in the first two to four years of a Clinton administration? You know, they may be fighting over the appropriations into the next year. We just don't know, and they've debt ceiling, and these are always tough votes. But I think it depends on her. I think at this point, and her willingness to move over, uh, and I think the Senate will accommodate themselves. The House is a little bit tougher, but what we've seen is when the Senate takes leadership, sometimes they can stuff the House. Uh, so I think it's, that, that's very, very critical. Uh, I, I would just interrupt to say, at present, the Senate... The, the, the Republicans who have both houses of Congress right. are having a hard time renaming post offices because Tim Hewell's camp is saying the process by which one renames post offices is not transparent. That's enough. right. Everything, so, so, even the e easy things are hard. Let yeah. me just say this about uh, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton found a rhythm to governing. Uh, I w and I'd like to say my, my constituency in Northern Virginia elected me in 1994 to protect them from Bill Clinton, and two years later they re-elected Clinton to protect him from me. <laughs> But, but you do have people there who want things done. But he had a rhythm to governing. You could blast him one day, and the next day he'd sit up there and it would send somebody up and negotiate your bill. The, the, the leaders after them have had a hard time doing that. Yeah. There is a rhythm to governing, but it really depends on the chief executive. Uh, the governor, uh, Rendell, had that rhythm to governing in Pennsylvania. But it's not easy to achieve with these interest groups out there. If I could just jump in. Uh, of course, I had the rhythm of governing because we had earmarks. 
Right. And it was amazing right. how many Republicans. Wait, do you think earmarks need to be brought back? Uh, I would love no, to see No, some them. people will say yes. I would love to see them brought back with cer certain constraints. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd like to see them brought back because it gives you a currency. Right now, one of the problems is there are a lot of people in the Congress who don't want to do anything. And if you don't want to do anything, it's tough to make deals with them. But I, I think Tom's right. If you look at the Senate on immigration, 68 votes for immigration, uh, 17 Republican senators, I think, 17, backed it. And then it goes to the House. And in the House, the biggest problem is something, a, a rule of the Republican caucus, which was named the Hasrick Rule. I assume it's in the process of being renamed. But it was named the Hasrick Rule. Just a hunch. Um, I think yes. And the You're not allowed said, to say the word Hastert. It was the Gingrich anymore. rule before that. It has to be. <laughs> but it's, it says that the caucus has to approve of something, over 50% of the caucus, before the speaker will list it for a vote. Well, if John Boehner had taken that Senate immigration bill yeah. and put it on the floor, there were 35 to 40 Republican congressmen, including all of my suburban Republican congressmen, who would have raised their hands, voted yes, and we would have had immigration reform which was basically, I think, a good bill for America. But so the key, if Hillary Clinton becomes president, the key person is Paul Ryan. Yeah. Well, let's, let's well, Governor Richardson, I know you wanted to get in here and then. Yeah, I do. I just want to say, and this is clearly uh, from a, my viewpoint and a partisan viewpoint in, in a way, but I think Hillary would be a more successful president with a Republican Senate where she could get things through the Senate that would be more acceptable to the House and actually become law. Wait, can because, you explain why you think that, exactly how yeah, that would work? Well, because Mitch McConnell will work with Paul Ryan, and he will be very, he is very strategic, and he would work with Hillary to say, okay, here's what we can do and get it all the way through, and what are your absolute musts, here are our absolute musts, and he would be able to work together. Can I just push back on that for one second? Because don't you think the Republican leadership is gonna be focused on keeping Hillary Clinton a one-term president and wanna do absolutely nothing by way of giving her a win legislatively? No, I don't. I think the Congress will want to be productive. I think Mitch McConnell will want to be productive. I will tell you that uh, when I was still there at the end of 2012 and uh, we were trying to uh, work with the Obama administration um, on tax issues and the fiscal cliff, um, and Mitch could not get action out of the Democrats in the Senate, um, he called Joe Biden. He said, who can I deal with that we can take something to the president? And Joe said, me, mm -hmm. the vice president said, me, and they did, and within 24 hours, they had an agreement that went to the president and was signed. I mean, I think Hillary has shown, I mean, your question was, if Hillary were president. Now, I think sure. if Trump were president, I think the Republican Senate would be very important for holding him into <laughs> a doable um, right. Holding uh, his mission. feet to earth, if you yeah. will. Well, um, your words. Except, <laughs> except Kate, I, the Senate's going to have to meet in Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> I, I want to get to a Trump presidency in one minute, but Governor Richardson, I know Well, I, I, I'm going to disagree with the senator. I think the best for uh, President Clinton would be a, the House is going to stay the same, would be a Democratic Senate. I, I think there's no question. Be, for a lot of political and substantive reasons. But I think the key question you asked, what could possibly be done? Mm -hmm. What could, you know, the American people, I, I think on a bipartisan basis, there are some potential agreements. A jobs program that involves an infrastructure bank to rebuild, you know, our grid, our roads, our highways, uh, financed by possibly repatriated corporate taxes that would come back and be used to fund the infrastructure bank. Uh, I think that infrastructure issue that is something that, that is an apple that, that can be plucked. I also think that on the national security front, 
Uh, you could probably, because of all the hacking, an agreement, a bipartisan agreement on a cybersecurity strategy, an intelligence strategy. You know, the, the Russians may be deciding who the next president is with their <laughs> hack. I'm, I'm kidding, but but I think this has become such a such a serious problem. I think clean uh, manufacturing is going to get a boost with incentives. Uh, clean energy will get a boost, uh, I believe. Uh, I don't think we'll have a a major energy bill, but I think basically the Obama energy strategy is going to continue. Immigration, I think, is going to be a casualty, unfortunately. I think that... You don't think that will get dealt No, not with. right away and not soon because I think what Trump has done is he's scared so many potential Republican moderates that might be supportive, you know, like the McCains, like the uh, House members that uh, were... You know, the New York Times had a piece about 15 of them working to get an immigration bill. But I think he spooked them. Yeah. He spooked so that uh, an immigration, a comprehensive immigration reform bill um, will not, I think, early on be. I think Secret uh, Clinton will try. First hundred days, she said she will. And she has a chance. She's a, you know, she will work the Congress a mm -hmm. lot. She, she's a, you know, she works the, and, and, and I think... Uh, the senator is right. She, she was very respected in the Senate. I think she's going to try to work with the Congress herself. Bring them in. You've got to talk to people. Yeah. You know, this is one of the reasons we have uh, this dysfunction. Members of Congress, the Senate, they don't know each other anymore because they're always traveling. They're fundraising. They come in for three days. I used to know Tom Davis. We, we took a couple of trips together, didn't we, Tom? Well, we, my point is that that we know each other, our families know each other. They don't know each other yeah. now. They just toss barbs. They go on, you know, on, on news. They fire fundraising. You get a fundraising note every three minutes now on my iPhone. Right. You know, somebody said this, so send me this. It's out of control. Alex, like, I, Let me, can I just yeah. say one thing? I, I agree with them. Earmarks, if you want to get an infrastructure bill through, you have to have project designation by members. It gives them basically skin in the game, Republicans and Democrats. Since they took those away, it may be a good soundbite, but think of it this way. You've let the Republican Congress let Obama des designate where the money is going. Yeah. It's a huge transfer of power. It doesn't make any sense. Secondly, it, it gives leadership some tools so everybody has skin in the game and pass it and allows members to personalize their districts. If they will go back to this, I think both parties want an infrastructure bill, but you can't do it without giving members uh, uh, something to bring back home. Can I go back to this point that Governor Richardson is making about people spending time with each other? Mm -hmm. um, th this moment in American, I, I, I think a lot of people understand that, right? That makes a lot of sense. At the same time, the climate is such that just being in Washington is seen as being in a bad place. Chumminess inside, backroom deals, which is in fact where legislation gets hammered out and passed. That has been vilified, that whole process. Um, you know, the idea that you're sort of part, a cog in the Washington machine, I mean, that is, that's how the government functions. How do you get back to a place with the American public, we're, we're saying, I'm spending more time in Washington. I'm spending more time with fellow members. It's not a bad thing. It's not a disqualifying thing for people in public office. You, you spend time with your party caucuses, and it's red jerseys versus blue jerseys. Mm -hmm. We used to have bipartisan retreats, Bill. Remember those yeah, yeah. where we get up yeah, together? Yeah. I mean, you need to go back to this. The Green where, Briar, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> where, where members can bring their families and socialize uh, together. But the question is, how bad has it gotten? We have a look. My congressional district was outside of Washington, D.C., so we were all Redskins fans in football season. And the owner of the Redskins a couple weeks ago admitted that the term Washington Redskins was polarizing and divisive and was thinking of changing the name from the Washington Redskins to just the Redskins. I mean, <laughs> that's how bad it's gotten. Yeah, that's how he functions. <laughs> uh, I mean, but it is a question. Uh, now, I will say, uh, Senator Hutchinson, Women in, in the Senate, and to some degree in the House, have had a much better time establishing a bipartisan sort of bipartisan relations, getting together, working in concert to get legislation passed. So having more women in the Senate could be an answer. But generally, yes. <laughs> What, why, do you, why do you think that is? And, and talk to us a little, if you can, about your experience navigating both sides of the aisle. Well, actually, the uh, women in the Senate met for dinner probably every month, six weeks. Um, 
and not to talk about issues so much, but is to but just to talk about our challenges or just whatever. Uh, but we were very much able to talk um, about how we could have a way forward if we needed one. Um, and that was an enormous help. I remember when, um, I can't remember which issue was being filibustered, but uh, <laughs> it was the women of the Senate who came together, Republicans and Democratic women, and they broke the impasse. Um, and I think that the relationships are very important. And uh, Lady Bird Johnson once told me that the, when, when they were in the Senate, there would be six months, the first six months of the year would be in Washington, and then they went home for six months mm -hmm. and did their districts or their states. And she said they would, you know, they would have dinner parties, they would know each other, they would know their kids, and they were friends. And you could fight ferociously on the floor, but you could understand where people were coming from, and it was different from where you were coming mm -hmm. from, but everybody had the right to voice and represent their constituents who had elected them. And so I think having the capability to travel back and forth and more people having their families at home yeah. and not staying the weekends even in Washington uh, has not been a good thing. I think if people understand more about where the other person is coming from, then you can work things out that are win-win situations. And I think Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill showed yeah. that. I mean, um, Everett Dirksen um, working with Johnson. I mean, those were people who were very different but understood how to move uh, America forward. You were mentioning the infrastructure, which I, I excuse me, I co-sponsored with John Kerry, an infrastructure bank bill, um, no. which ended up dying in the Senate. But um, that was something that we could do because we all agreed on the mission. What the corporate tax rate? America's is the highest in the world. The president has said he would be for lowering it. So has Hillary, so have the uh, Senate Republicans and the Senate Democrats. And that has been for the last four years. Right. And here we are with no relief for our corporations and we wonder why the jobs are overseas. Well, you know, there's a simple solution and everybody agrees on it. Why can't we move it forward? Let, let me ask you, I know that we've sort of explored uh, a future in which Hillary Clinton wins the presidency. I'd like for us all to put on our time machine hats. <laughs> Not that hats can be time machines, but Governor Rendell, if Donald Trump becomes president, it, you suggested this a few moments ago, is there a chance that he governs from some strange middle and that it actually is a boon to centrism? It's, it's possible. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to say what he would do, and it's almost impossible to codify him in any one box because he literally changes from day to day. But I think he would be a transactional president. Mm. Transactional presidents tend to do better than ideological presidents. And if Donald Trump becomes president, I think the most important person in trying to get things done will be Chuck Schumer. And the good news is Donald Trump, as he reminds us all the time, <laughs> has been a big contributor to Chuck Schumer right. in the past, <laughs> as he was to Hillary Clinton, you know. Uh, so I think there, there, there's a possibility that that, that would work. Um, hmm. I'll tell you one thing we haven't talked about, which I think cures a lot of the ills we're facing, and I was always against this. For m most of my political career, it was only in my last term as governor that I came to the inevitable conclusion that we have to have legislative term limits. Now, I know they don't work well, I know there are problems with them, but legislative term limits, in my judgment, would cure a lot of these things. If you know you're gonna, gonna if you're in your seventh year and you know your term limit is out at 10, you'll take a vote that maybe, it's not so much ideology all the time, it's fear of losing. And I think Bill said that, it's fear of being primaried, it's fear of losing a general election. It's fear of losing. We've got to take away the fear of losing. But how do you do that? 
I mean, how do you get anybody to say, look, I mean, who's going to agree to that? In the same way that who's going to agree that the King redistricting... Of Dre- the King Sorry, of Revolution, the Contract for America pledged... Yeah, to we the did. In fact, I uh, voted on it. Uh, right. The first. Yeah, we co-sponsored the bill. Didn't go anywhere, by the way. <laughs> did, did, you, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. did you hear that, uh, Alex? Yes. The senator sponsored the bill. T- term limits... We used to have citizen soldiers. And when the founders created the, the, the government... It was very common for someone to serve in the legislature for two, four years, and then go back home and do whatever they did before. Right. Well, see, that's what I would make the point about term limits. Uh, not so much the fear of losing, which I think is a good point, but I think also if someone knows that first they have to have a real job, they have to have a real profession, they have to know uh, from the ground up, so many of our people have never had a real job in the private sector. They have been a county commissioner and then a congressman and then a senator, and they've never had a real and job. And they're frightened of losing their pension. That's when I came in, I raised uh, half a billion dollars for early childhood education, and it was part of the tax package, which was the second largest tax increase in Pennsylvania history. Um, I had my own Democrats come to me and say, Governor, I know you're right, we need the money for education, but I'm three years away for the, from my pension and I can't risk losing. Oh. And that's so painful, yeah. so it's painful. And by the way, we passed the second largest tax increase in Pennsylvania history. I was reelected by 21 points. And Rendell for president? No, no, I, 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 what I'm saying is voting for taxes, if, if, if something comes from those taxes, right. if the citizens see value, is not a death sentence. Uh, Look, the problem with term limits is it takes a constitutional amendment. That's just a a very uh, tall hill that you have to climb. Uh, I I think it would probably go through the states for Congress, maybe not for state legislators. (laughs) But you've got to get it out of Congress and people are voting to limit their own terms. And that's a tough vote for members, as as, uh, the governor said. But uh, states have done it. Yes, they have. And usually it's done through initiative and not through the legislators doing it themselves. Governor, let me let me go back to the the, tr- the Trump question to you yeah. in terms of what what the implicate because we're talking a lot about sort of the present and if we look at the future, w- do you think there's room for moderation and centrism in a Trump administration? You know, God help us, but um, <laughs> right away, no. See, my my view is this. I I and I don't you know I don't want to give a political speech here, but. I think the man's temperament, his lack of knowledge, his, you know, his, the, the way he treats people doesn't augur well mm-hmm. uh, when he has to make such important decisions. So I'm not very, very optimistic and positive. What I would like to see if that happens, and I don't think it will, but if it does, I want a strong Congress mm-hmm. to ch- check on him. To uh, and 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 that's Republicans and Democrats to, you know, say you know you can't you can't do this because most of what he wants to do uh, has to go through Congress, uh, you know, except some of the immigration stuff, the the banning of of Muslims and you know the the, the deportation, the courts have even halted yeah. that with so. I, I don't see, even though, you know, you don't know where, where he's coming from, um, I, I just, you, you have to look at the person's character, and, and I, I don't, I'm not very optimistic. I mean, I, I just you don't worry. See, you don't would, see no, moderation. No, no. You don't but, see but, moderate in this. But I will say this, I have been wrong about him. I thought he was not going to make it through the first primary. I've been wrong about Bernie Sanders doing so well. I've been wrong about, you know, I thought that, if, I thought John Kasich and, I thought that uh, I thought that uh, Bush, Bush uh, we're going to do we're going to do a lot better. Uh, so I'm out of touch. I, I, <laughs> so so don't take my. But but you you are all creatures of American politics, and we're going to go to questions in just a second. I would ask you. You know we've talked about systems that I think encourage bifurcation, whether it's technology, gerrymandering, money in politics, the media. Do you think that the American people themselves are becoming more extreme? Sort, and, and this is to the question of sorting themselves into rural and urban areas, surrounding themselves with like-minded folks, not just, the, not just listening to the media, but 
developing communities where one opinion is shared and that's, that opinion is held closely. I mean, is that fact or fiction? I'd start with Alex, you. Alex, let me start. I, I think, I don't know that the American public has, but I think the party activists have. So I think the people, that, if you take a look at voter registration, the fastest growing group are independents. It's not Republicans or Democrats. Now, they're not all moderate, all independents, but the party activists have certainly moved right or left, and the polling shows that Republicans are more ideologically right than they were 20 years ago. Democrats are more ideologically, like, self-described. But there's a vast middle that is just doesn't participate in the nomination process, and they get stuck with basically the nominees the parties give them. So I'm not sure the public, I think there is a, a radical center, they just, they don't participate in the nomination process, and so they have to make the most of what they're given. Is that their fault? Sure. So, go ahead. Well, I, I just think they're, all Americans right now, most voters, there's an unease out there about income inequality, about jobs, lack of opportunity, manufacturing jobs, leaving. Um, you know, a sense that, you know, maybe Wall Street's doing well, uh, maybe certain people, the 1% are doing, but, but what about me and my family and student loans? So there's an unease there. I think the American people basically, are they're intelligent. They, they know what's going on. In the end, they do the right thing. But when there's such leadership, such little leadership given to them as options, you know, they, they go into a, a shell and they, they're, they're angry and they, you know, the Tea Party, I, I, the Tea Party forms. And so um, I, th I think what, what basically is needed is, is somehow to be practical. And, you know, I, I, I agree with Eddie about term limits, but it's not going to happen. You know, you got a constitution, a member of Congress doesn't want to give up their jobs. You know, forget it. So it's a, it might, I think it makes sense. Maybe some advancement there. Public financing, I think, some kind of campaign reform. Maybe the Supreme Court will get rid of, you know, the super PACs. That, that would be some progress. But, but I think eventually both parties have to answer this issue of income inequality, of job opportunity, of this technology that is at the same time a, a big boon to our country. Somehow, you know, privacy issues, somehow issues relating to um, inflaming without any kind of accountability, we, we have to deal with that. And, and I think that's what's fueling a discontent. I think the American people, voters are smart. They eventually see what's going on. And our system, I, I know this sounds corny, I, our system works. You know, the Congress, if, if Trump is elected and he starts, you know, going off, I bet you the Congress will say, hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not how we do things. Does the system work? Well, the checks and balances clearly does work. The courts can be a check on a, on a president, the Congress can be a check on a president. But to go back to the original question, I think there's cause for optimism because even though the right and left have been built up and they're ideological, when the American people are asked the poll question, do you want members of your, your Congress representatives to work together and compromise to get things mm -hmm. done, 70% of the American people answer yes. There are some people out there who say, no, I don't want them talking to the other side, I don't want any compromise. But 70% of the American people, an overwhelming majority, want to get things done. And I think, it, say you're Paul Ryan's political advisor. Hillary Clinton becomes president. Paul Ryan, I believe, one day would like to be president. Does Paul Ryan choose to screw up everything Hillary does to run against her in 2020? Or does Paul Ryan say, I'm going to make the American government work. We're going to get things done on energy. On That's pretty selfless. And run for president in 2024 as the guy who made the government work. What do you choose? And do, and does do you think the, Paul Ryan will get the credit, though? Get if, what? He, if he does make the government work again. You don't think that the Republicans will see that as giving some victories to Hillary Clinton? If someone makes his government work again, I think they'd, they'd be carried down Main Street in a... Uh, one of those chairs. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And plus, I do believe P Paul Ryan, in his heart of hearts, wants America to move forward. And I, I think Kay is right, and, and, and the congressman is right. It depends on the president. 
The executive, and Bill can tell you this, the executive has to make the first move. If there's going to be compromise, if there's going to be cooperation, it has to come from the executive. I said to my legislators often, you can blame it on me. When I did the tax increase, I needed 18 Republican votes in, the, in the, my House of Representatives. I wrote a letter out and I said, I will send this letter to everyone who votes, any Republican who votes for the tax increase. And the letter essentially said, Dear Representative Smith, your vote on the tax increase was important to the future of Pennsylvania. Your constituents should not hold it against you. They should say it was a positive step. And you can use it in your campaign for re-election. <laughs> and guess what? They used them? I got the 18 votes. <laughs> and some of them used How it. How many of them were re-elected? <laughs> All of them. No, in marginal All districts. Them, only one but, incumbent uh, lost. Senator in marginal Hutchison. districts, that's a good housekeeping seal of approval. <laughs> Absolutely. No Senator Hutchinson, let's finish with you before we go to the audience. Is there, as has been proposed, some quiet but nonetheless substantive temperate American middle that we're just ignoring? Oh, yes. I, I think there is a There's quiet... There's a long pause. A quiet, silent majority out there who um, are very um, unhappy with the choices that they have um, of the nominees of the parties uh, up and down the ballot. Um, yes, I think, and they, that they had seventeen Republicans needs... to choose from, though. I mean, I just—at what point <laughs> can they find something to say yes to? Well, I think more people have to bite the bullet and get involved in party primaries, because if only the ideologues are in the party primaries, then you're not going to have the candidates that have that more uh, centrist view. I mean, I don't consider myself a moderate. I consider myself a conservative. But I work with the people who are elected by the people. And um, so I think you can have a party uh, label, but you've got to vote in a party primary, and you've got to go to the precinct convention after the vote is taken to make sure that the platform is something that you can live with. It's, it's interesting, in European countries, there, there, there's the center, and there's the center right, and the far yeah. right. There's the center left, and the far left. Senator Hutchinson is clearly a conservative, but she'd be in the center right if this was a parliamentary system of government. And certainly Tom, Tom would have been probably right smack in the middle of the center. Bill would have been the far left. And Governor Rendell would Bill be. Bill would have been the far left. <laughs> yeah. I would be the center left. <laughs> okay, on that, let's go to the audience for some questions. Uh, there should be mics floating around, I believe. If you want to raise your hand and direct your question to someone on stage, and please try and keep the questions concise. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sandy Dochin locally with IBM. Obviously, we predictably are very much for TPP. Governor, you, you brought that up. What has business done wrong, or what have others done wrong in not making the argument for it, is that we need to talk about more job training, retraining. Um, I think it puts the U.S. at a huge disadvantage, regardless of what company I'm with, if it doesn't happen. How can we all do a better job of explaining that to people who just seem to be worried about it and confused about their future? Governor Rendell. Well, well the problem is explaining why trade is good for America requires a nuanced answer. Donald Trump has a very simple message. You lost your job because of trade. Easy to understand. Not necessarily true. Probably four out of every five manufacturing jobs that have been lost were lost to technology, not to trade. And different type of manufacturing jobs are created by trade. But it's a nuanced message. You've got to get people to listen and to think it through. For example, all these people who hate trade, where do they shop? They shop at Walmart. Where do 90% of Walmart's goods come from? Why are they so low priced? They come from China. Okay, you're against trade? No more Walmart. No more Walmart. You're against trade? Well, you're not driving a t Toyota anymore. You know, it's, it's, a, it's always difficult in politics for the people whose message to be understood, who have a nuanced message, message to be understood, have to talk a little bit of time. That's why the debates, the debates, Absolutely, two minutes to answer questions about how to get the economy moving again. 
Good it's Lord. too long, isn't it? It's yeah, too much, much time. Too long, much too our, long. our next question over here. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask the two Republicans on the panel if they're supporting Donald Trump and why or why not. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Why don't we start with uh, Congressman Davis? Well, we don't have much choice. I, uh, as as Republican, you got the court and the regulatory agencies and everything else. Not a campaign I really want to be associated with, but you get a choice on election day. So that's a yes. I'm not answering that question. Okay. I think that's an answer in and of itself. Um, I, I, I will guess where the two governors' hearts are on that question. Over here. Hello. Great discussion. My name is Henry Price. I am a student. You guys have said a lot today that I can really, you know, I took some notes. You said the fastest growing group of registered voters are independents, that there's a dearth of leadership options in Washington. You mentioned that checks and balances do work, that the silent majority is unhappy with the picks, and that there is a multi-party system in West Europe that works as well. That being said, what role do you think a third party can play in making sure that the center holds? Yeah, Governor Richardson, do you want to take a stab Well, at that? I'm a strong believer in the two-party system. I think the best reform comes within the two parties. Um, um, I, I think right now um, the, the, uh, the, the party that uh, former governor of my state and Bill Weld, uh, the Libertarian Party, is not going to make the debates. They're not going to get 15%. Will they be spoilers? Uh, possibly, I don't think so. I think p both parties have their constituency. But I will tell you there will be a viable independent party if this gridlock continues in the next administration, whatever administration. I bet you a Ross Perot type candidate uh, in an independent party, not green, not libertarian, uh, emerges should there be an impasse legislatively, should there be the divisions that we've had. That, that's my view right now. I would just add that I have watched uh, governments in other countries where there are proliferation of parties, and I think a two-party system is by far superior in the stability of governing, because at least when you are uh, in a two-party system, we know what the Democratic basic agenda is and the Republican basic agenda. But if you have a third party out there and so one party doesn't get a majority, you see the um, plurality winner having to have coalitions and they have the coalitions with fringe parties and so they never have the ability to govern and be judged by the people on keeping their promises. So I think as, as Inefficient as it is, the two-party system is by far superior. We just need more people to be involved in the party primaries so that there is a central theme on which people can rely when they vote. Let's go here. Abby Livingston, Washington Bureau Chief of the Texas Tribune. Uh, my question is for Senator Hutchison. Um, you touched on the unique relationship among female senators. Um, can you describe what it was like to work with then-Senator Hillary Clinton and what we can glean from that and how she would govern as president. Oh, I found working with the male senators great. I, I didn't feel that I was any less valued. Uh, my opinion was not less valued. I was in leadership uh, on the Republican side um, because every vote is equal. So um, I think by the time you have gotten to the, that level, um, I felt a great camaraderie with the male senators. Um, there, were, uh, there was a special feeling among uh, women senators because most of us had struggled in, in different ways, but we had had to overcome obstacles. I certainly did. Um, being taken seriously uh, in the beginning was hard for a woman. Um, all of us had to face that. And so we, we talked about our common struggles. We wrote a book. Uh, when I first got to the Senate, we wrote a book um, about our different struggles and how we overcame them that was, um, we gave all the um, profits to the Girl Scouts of America and they started a leadership uh, 
uh, project for Girl Scouts uh, to learn from our different experiences of how we overcame obstacles. So you do have a bond there, but in the main, uh, some of my best friends were my male colleagues and uh, also my female colleagues, and my female Democratic colleagues are some of my best friends. Over here. Uh, my name is Brandon Siegenfeld, and I'm the founder of epistocracy.com. It's a political network. Um, it was mentioned that cable TV and social media are negatively impacting the center, uh, most likely through the echo chamber, uh, where people only hear similar views leading to increasing extremism, um, especially since social media is playing a larger and larger role and creates the face of political leadership and shapes people's views. How can we make it possible for a center to actually emerge on social media if the most extreme and emotional controversial voices are rising and uh, gaining publicity above the more moderate ones that are based um, in logic as opposed to emotion? So how do we create this public face on these new networks uh, for the moderates? Governor Rendell, I know you do a lot of work for NBC, so maybe you could talk a little bit about uh media and sort of the responsibility in forming or carving out some kind of center? Well, social media has not, not been a positive towards carving out the center because the people who use social media are the ones who feel the most passionate and they again tend to be from the extremes. Uh, I know I'm doing something right when I get hate tweets <laughs> from the left and the right. Uh, and I, I got so many hate tweets from, we, we used to call them the Bernie bots, the extreme Sanders people. I told a story last night at the convention. I was down in the hallway and Jane Sanders comes along with her son and daughter. She sees me, she runs up to me, gives me a hug, and she said, Bernie said, you're one of the few Clinton people who always treated him fairly. And I wished with all my heart that someone had got that on, uh, uh, on <laughs> videotape, I would have posted it, and all of the, the Bernie bots could have, take, take that, you Bernie bots. But it, it doesn't lend itself to, this, to the center. The same reason that, as Senator Hutchinson says, people in the center don't necessarily vote in primaries. They care about the country, but they're not passionate, and the social media is for the passionate. If I was king of the world and could make one change in social media, you have to give your real name. Right. Yeah, and your photo you of yourself. Your thinking own. the same thing. You can give your real name. I'm yeah. so sick and tired of getting uh, tweets, uh, vicious tweets from you know, the Jack, Jack and the Beanstalk or whatever. <laughs> so I, I don't think social media, okay. the way it's currently used, is a positive force for the center's view. Let's get, let's get a comment from Governor Richardson and Congress. Well, I think um, internationally, I will say, for instance, social media, the April, spring, that was good because dictators, bad governments were toppled. Uh, social media was used to organize and I think that was very healthy. The problem now is not just in Europe but in America, social media has an enormous impact in stating views and dislodging people and spreading things and, you know, and, and, and educating, but there has to be some way that social media users care more about governance, governance. In other words, once you've, you know, cleaned the house, what are you gonna do, all right? Now, the, and I, I don't think, I, I don't wanna disagree with Eddie because he's become such a statesman <laughs> lately. Go ahead. But, but, I, but I do think, Eddie, I, I don't, you know who uses social media more than anybody? Millennials, and they're gonna decide this election. So, and they're not extreme, they're not right, you know, this is how they communicate. And so I think that the, the, to, to categorize them as, as being you know, far left, far right, I don't think is accurate. I think there is a so, silent majority within social media users, and that's how they communicate. You know, that's how they, instead of going to you know, precinct of meetings, they, they communicate by social media. And I think generally it's healthy, but we've got to deal with a privacy issue. We've got to find ways, you know, I get, I'll go on TV and I'll get, you know, a thousand, no, I'll get a terrible reaction. This is one of the things I told the Clinton people. You know, I, I defend her with Sanders. All the Sanders people had come after me. And then, uh, now with Trump, is like about 80 to zero 
when I defend her, you know, Trump has a following. The intensity possibly maybe is a little bit on the right on social media, maybe. Let, let's get Congressman Davis's, and then we're going to have to wrap yeah, this up. I'm I, sorry. I, I do think this stuff sorts itself out. I think we're still in its infancy in terms of using social media. But just let's face it, we have a system today where a member gets up in the State of the Union and yells, you lie, and they're a media star, and they raise a million dollars online the next <laughs> week. I, I think that will sort itself out over the long term as both sides in the middle start to use it a little more. But in its infancy, it's the passionate that tend to govern it, and that t they tend to be more ideological. I liked Governor Rendell's idea of having to use your actual name. Actual name. I would also say instead of that Twitter egg photo, you got to have a photo of yourself. Culpability. All right, we are going to leave it there. I will make one quick housekeeping announcement. The Texas Tribune has arranged for a sampling of Austin's premier food truck vendors to okay. serve lunch under the UT Tower on the university's main mall. Our programming will resume at 1.45 p.m. That is all for us. Big thanks to our Thank esteemed you. panel. Thank you for coming. Thanks for participating in the festival.